as, as you said, I'm Norman Ashley. I'm the chief executive of the, of the Science Park. And the Science Park uh, itself is, is an organization aiming to create a network, self-sustaining, internationally recognized uh, science park, which is commercially and research driven uh, for knowledge-based industries serving the whole of Northern Ireland. You can see I really memorized that when I wrote it many years ago. But actually collaboration is the name of the game, and today's event is actually a collaboration between our own NISP Connect and uh, and, and buy a business. <coughs> Connect is our uh, community-led support service for science and technology entrepreneurs. It's heavily modeled and has been highly supported by, not least by Mary Walsh herself, giving uh, Steve an awful lot of her time and energy uh, during his, his learning experience uh, in, in San Diego. And the aim is to support and accelerate by dint of those who have already done it, but, uh, the most uh, experienced uh, people in Northern Ireland, they all do it pro bono, and that's to support the best offerings that we can that, that we can get. Biobusiness, on the other hand, is the business association for the health and, and the life and health technology sector in Ireland, and I think this is our first uh, full partnership. I'm very excited, very excited by it. Today's event is very important, crucially important, I think, because the whole philosophy that uh, Steve brought back to us from San Diego is the bridging of gaps between the different siloed sectors of business life. And it is vitally important that researchers know bankers, bankers know uh, uh, technologists, technologists know the entrepreneurs, and so on. And this is all part of that process because actually, modern knowledge-based economy needs the respect and uh, uh, <clears throat> well, basically the respect, the mutual respect between those different sectors. If you come with an, uh, with an idea needing money, you can't wait to build that up. You have to have it there and then, and that's what we're about. And that's why we're, we're, we're very grateful to Chris having agreed to do this, this uh, inaugural lecture. But just before I introduce him properly, I do want to say some thank yous to the steering team. There's Pastor McCloskey from Queens, John McRae from Ulster, Glenn Kennedy from AFB, uh, David Linus from Carson McDowell, Neil Hendren from Arthur Cox, Thomas Dixon from McGregor's, and Catherine Walls from uh, Mill Selig. And of course, uh, we have Peter, Peter Donnelly, I don't know, uh, just Peter, he's not here, from Bio Business itself, and naturally the team at Riddle Hall. And I do want to thank Peter. This is his second chore, and he's only joined us three or four weeks, so for his enthusiasm, all that he's done. So now on to the real meat of today, and that's, and that's Chris. And I want to introduce very, very briefly Professor Chris Shaw to you. Chris is Professor in Drug Discovery within the School of Pharmacy here at, at, at Queen's University. And I'm just reading directly from his bio, bio that's, that, that's on the Queen's website, and it refers to his exciting work. And I think exciting is used too frequently, but in this case it does not uh, really describe the intensity with which, with which Chris, Chris does his work and the, and the, the, the results he's getting. And his work involves the discovery and characterization of biologically active agents within nature, most often from amphibian uh, venoms that he harvests worldwide. Now the rest of his bio goes into long words that are Greek derived, which I'm not going to try and even pronounce. I'm just going to say, I'm, uh, my, one of my favorite films is Medicine Man, so I'm only going to describe him as Nolan Allen's own Medicine Man. He's not as good looking as Sean Connery. <laughs> Please welcome Chris to the forum. Chris. <laughs> I'd just like to begin by disagreeing with the last comment. <laughs> <laughs> Has he seen Sean Connery recently? <laughs> it's, it's a great honor for Ari and myself, the co-founders of, of this company I'm going to tell you about today, to have been uh, offered this opportunity by the Northern Ireland Science Park uh, to give this inaugural lecture in their frontiers in, in science and technology program. And Alfexion is a company that specializes in biological therapeutics. And biological therapeutics is a very, very broad church indeed, ranging from things such as monoclonal antibodies, as, uh, as potential new therapeutics to interfering RNAs as potential therapeutics 
But we believe we have a niche uh, area within this very broad church of biological therapeutics. And what you see here is the star of the show. This is the supermodel of the amphibian world, the red-eyed leaf frog that you see in posters and pictures all over the place. And this picture was taken when I worked in the University of Ulster at Coleraine in our amphibian unit there. And actually the photographer Nigel, who took this photograph, won the Kodak Award. And this picture was actually in Times Square, New York, uh, for New Year's Day 2001. So uh, this little amphibian kept up to the, the title of amphibian supermodel. And what are we interested in from this group of organisms? We're interested in a class of molecules called peptides. And peptides are basically natural molecules that are made of chains of amino acids that are themselves natural molecules. And over the course of 35 years of researching this particular messenger system in animals, I've come to the conclusion that these peptides represent the vocabulary of intercellular communication. So this is the, the whole series of words, if you like to call it that that one cell uses to talk to another cell. Um, when the penny dropped it, that's what these molecules actually were. It struck me immediately that if we can, A, understand the language and what the words actually mean, then we can change those words or reinforce those words to make cells do what we want them to do. And of course, that fundamental underlying principle has got enormous applications in terms of drug development. So peptides are released when they're required. They transmit this molecular message from cell to cell. And here is a very key point about peptides as drug lead compounds. They then disappear. They are broken down into their individual amino acids and they are recycled within the body. So there are no nasty metabolites that are either retained within the body or excreted in the excretory system. They are safe green molecules, if you like to call it that. And our focus has been on venoms, many different animal venoms, predominantly those of frogs. And we reckon that these molecules that constitute these vast array of libraries represent what the pharma industry call new chemical space. They represent a whole inventory of novel molecules designed by nature, present in nature, that we have only just begun to understand and tap into for their many different qualities and properties as drug agents. So in essence, they are one of our most valuable, natural, natural, and renewable resources. They really do tick all the boxes in terms of the new generation of pharmaceutical substances. Each venom has between 60 and 1,000 unique peptides. And up until now, within our group in the university, we have assembled a library somewhere in excess of 200,000 such molecules. And we've only really just begun to mine the potential of that. And unlike the medicinal chemist who will make a molecule in a test tube, maybe taking a few weeks or months to do that, these molecules have been in the biosphere out there in the rainforests, in the deserts, in the grasslands for 200 plus million years. And that's not a static process. They are the product today of nature's research and development program, which is called natural selection. Now, how can those molecules be in any way compared with synthetic chemicals uh, that take a few decades to produce in a laboratory? And I think the answer to that question is very, very obvious. Another key point is that the peptides that we work with have been engineered and optimized in nature, as I said before. But the key point is they have been engineered and selected to interact with mammalian biological targets. And for those of you who are not biologically trained, we are a mammal. So for mammalian, we human. So in essence, these are not random molecules produced in a test tube that may or may not do something relevant in your body as a drug. These have been honed to perfection, and indeed the end point 
from their natural selection has been molecular targets within your body. Some of those molecular targets are disease related. They are either very specific for a diseased cell or are massively overproduced by a certain disease cell. So here we have basically a library of molecules, a suitcase full of wares that we have virtually untapped until now. And that is where Alfexion Biological Therapeutics comes in. These molecules achieve powerful therapeutic effects. A very good example of a peptide drug is actually one of the first drugs produced by the pharmaceutical industry, and that is insulin. Insulin is a natural molecule. It's a, quite a complex peptide structure. And up until the time when it became available, back about 90 years ago, type 1 diabetes was a lethal illness, just like cancer, for instance, is today. Although cancer today can be treated much more readily than type 1 diabetes could be treated in the 1920s, if you had type 1 diabetes, you would die very soon afterwards. And since this was a disease of children and young adults, it was a harrowing sight. The advent of this peptide, injectable peptide, given in the body by injection, still administered that way today, by the way, has saved countless hundreds of millions of lives. So effectively, this peptide has made an incurable disease, a lethal disease, and has turned it into a chronic disease. And um, if the individual person uh, looks after themselves in terms of blood sugar and insulin injections, they can live a full and relatively normal life. So these are very powerful in their therapeutic effects. And they are also high precision targeted. These are nature's cruise missiles. When they enter the body, they cause very little collateral damage. They go around the circulation, they find their specific target, they bind to that and they transmit their information then they are broken down and they disappear into the background. Almost the perfectly designed therapeutic molecules. So are life-based therapeutics. And the reason we say life-based therapeutics is that the pharmaceutical industry that was based upon molecules like morphine, like aspirin and such substances, these are what are called natural products. And these so-called natural products, although they come from nature, they are actually secondary metabolites of organisms. They are the toxins that they want to get rid of. So to paint a picture, our drug industry, which is just slightly more than 100 years old, was built upon humans searching and rooting through the garbage pile of nature. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? That we owe much of our well-being to that process. But what we are talking about today in Alfexion are molecules which are completely different. They are genetically encoded, they are naturally selected, and have been for a very long period of time, and they are precision targeted. And many of the drawbacks of conventional chemical drugs are overcome by this class of drug. And we believe our life-based technology, because remember, these molecules are obtained from living systems, not from garbage piles of secondary metabolites or dead tissues. Our life-based therapeutics represent the next generation in biotechnology. How did this all begin? Well, as a young man, some years ago, I became a junior technician in Queen's University, Belfast, at the age of 17. I've been working in the university now for 41 years, would you believe that? 41 years. It seems like yesterday. And my research interest began in neuroendocrinology. Strangely enough, in a group of molecules called peptides, which at that time were just being discovered to be present in huge amounts and huge diversity within our nervous system. And here you see a picture of, uh, of neurons with their numerous connections. Every organism that has a neuron has peptides in that neuron. That's true of our brain, and it's true of very primitive organisms, as you'll see in a moment. To the right here, you see a pancreatic islet the pale group of cells in the middle. These are the cells that produce insulin. But these pancreatic islets produce at least another four of these peptide hormones that regulate metabolic processes in the body. So my original research theme 
was understanding this peptide regulatory system in humans and what were the clinical applications of this. But there were many, many questions posed. So I began to think a little bit outside the box and began to say, answer such questions or address such questions as, are these human specific? Do these occur in more primitive organisms? How far back do they go? And is the language universal or does each group of animals has, have its own language? This is a picture taken from a, a paper from one of the last students in my group when I study parasitology. So these pictures show a parasitic fluke, a little flatworm, a very primitive organism. And we, our group actually put about the first such peptides in this whole group of animals. And here you see their nervous systems stained with antibodies to these peptides. You see them in bright green. So essentially, even these very primitive life forms, their nervous systems are full of peptides, which have some characteristics similar to ours, but they have some of those words that are very different. But the peptide uh, transmission system of information is universal throughout life forms that have nervous systems. And anyone who worked in peptides in those days was aware that frog skin was a very rich source of peptides, some of which were astonishingly similar to those in our brains, some of which were actually identical to those in our brain. So this concept of brain, gut, and skin triangle was established. That a lot of these messenger peptides are the same, are very similar in these three different organs. Not in human skin, I might add, but this skin triangle was referring to the skin of amphibians. The early papers were written in a way that each one apparently contained one peptide. And when we started doing about 20 years ago some preliminary work on these, we found they had hundreds of peptides. And that is where this whole area of research began. Professor John Daly was a visiting professor from the National Institutes of Health in our School of Pharmacy. And he was the man, probably above all others, that opened this field up, that unveiled this treasure trove of natural molecules. And the little yellow frog you see at the top there comes from Colombia. And it's called Philobates terribilis. The toxins in this frog are so toxic, if you touch it, you can die within 10 minutes. We don't work in those. I wouldn't have my students working in those. I don't want to pay the students every day. So, if I go to bar for it. The little red and white frog was one he discovered as well. And from that, he extracted a compound that was a painkiller 200 times more potent than morphine but was non addictive And that is still going through final clinical trials by adult laboratories. But what really intrigued me was the frog here, this big green tree frog, called the giant monkey frog, that was used by the Jaguar people of Colombia. And they used the secretion of this before they went hunting to stimulate their senses and to switch off their appetite. And this is what really caught me, that if the secretion of this frog can give you unlimited stamina. Just think if you had that going into the Olympics, Britain might win a medal, yeah. It enhanced all the senses and it switched off appetite. And I thought, this one species alone maybe has three or four useful drugs to introduce into human medicine. So I was really uh, set along the line of uh, understanding this system and studying this system. What you see in here is a cross section of frog skin in the middle. The poison glands, as opposed to the mucus glands, the mucus glands produce the mucus that makes frogs slippery, if ever you try to lift one. But the poison gland is unique in nature and produces this massive combinatorial array of peptides. We obtain these non invasively. I should say we hurt no animals in our research, and we kill no animals. The frog secretion is got non invasively by this gentle electrical stimulation. Now we don't electrocute the frog. It's one person's stereo factor. Yeah? And I've said this before, I think the frogs actually quite like it. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that soon after we do this to frogs, they spawn. And if, you, if you're a frog and you spawn in the lab, believe you me, you're a happy frog. Because if you tried to do it otherwise, you would never be there. <coughs> and that is what the secretion looks like. White, fluffy powder, a complex mixture of peptides. And we can get maybe 110 milligrams of that from one tree frog. So the amount of material we get from just one milking, as we call it, of a frog, 
it's enough for us to do all of our molecular biology in terms of DNA sequencing and all of our peptide isolation and sequencing. So we need just a tiny, tiny amount to be able to uh, hack into the system. And these are two of the frogs that we have actually got meat compounds from. The top is the Chinese jam for our belly food. And from that, we have a pro-angiogenic peptide of six residues. Angiogenesis is the growth of blood vessels. And this little peptide promotes the growth of blood vessels like no other agent that we know. And this can be used in cardiovascular disease generally and in wound healing. The paragrine waxy monkey frog, what a splendid name <laughs> for an organism. And what a splendid organism. We have got exactly the opposite molecule from it. We have got an anti-angiogenic, just seven residue peptide which stops the growth of blood vessels. And this has got enormous applications in cancer therapy, in rheumatoid arthritis, and in conditions such as wet macular degeneration. For these two peptides, we obtained the Medical Futures Award, which is a national medical innovation award in London of last year. And out of this meeting here, this is Mike Mosley, who is one of the directors uh, in, in the BBC. He is now producing a series, or commissioning a series called Jungle Doctors. So our lab at the university and our work will probably be showcased in this new BBC documentary series. On the basis of this, we got a worldwide uh, media blitz. And one of those journals that appeared in was Science Daily in Washington, D.C. And a young man who trolls this and trolls all the other literature every day actually picked this up in Stan's feeling, lifted the phone September of last year and gave me a call. And that young man is sitting here, Mr. Ari Mello. And the nine months since has been just exactly the gestation period of Alfexion Biological Therapeutics. And today we should be able to announce the launch of this company. It's done, it's dusted, it's seen. And we should be moving forward in the exploitation of these compounds, but other compounds as well. So the battle now is between the natural drugs or the synthetic drugs. And looking through the pharmaceutical industry, that battle has already been won. And what I will do now is I will hand over to Eric, the co-founder of this company, who will talk to you about the business case and what he found so intriguing by this area. Uh, hello, I'd like to first start out by saying uh, a big thank you to Steve Ward for giving me the privilege of speaking here today, and uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here in front of you explaining our new company. So, uh, Chris has gone through the science. I'm going to discuss the business behind how you actually uh, translate all this fascinating stuff into making some money. Um, this is a quotation that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal last year, and um, I am a pretty big fan of um, Eli Lilly's process. They've had a very tough time uh, in the media, and I think a lot of shareholders are very disgruntled by uh, the pace of their pipeline and where it is at in the drug development process, but I believe the company has uh, truly positioned itself very well to um, uh, really do well in the future. So. I think this quotation here says it all. I think that the last century was so focused on chemical medicines, which have many, many problems that everybody's well aware of, and that now the companies are all very interested in biological medicine, because we're, after all, we are dealing with biological entities. And so this is pretty much the exact focus of our company is, is making the next generation of these biological medicines. So unfortunately, I don't have the data from 2000. 10 and 11, but they would be continuing that upward trend. And anybody who's done any technical analysis or knows how to look at a stock chart would be seeing a very um, substantial breakout right now on this, and I apologize that it's not reflecting that correctly. Um, but this is the direction the whole farming universe seems to be going. Uh, everybody's heard about the patent cliff and the issues with a lot of the drugs that are coming off patent. Um, well, there's several things that drug companies do very well. Uh, they're very good at identifying a drug. They're very good at uh, doing the sales and marketing of the drug, the manufacturing, most of the time. 
And uh, there's something that companies like us do very well, which is that we have the creative process. We come up with the ideas, and they recognize these ideas, and this is what makes them purchase someone like us in the future. So this slide here, you can get a sense for the scope and scale of biologic drugs. It is absolutely exploding. Um, and again, this data is you know, generated in 2010, and uh, the, I don't have the data for 2011 yet, but you can see the acceleration of this trend there. Um, these are some of the markets that our peptides will treat. Um, we have patents on two of them, as Chris has explained, but we also have nine other patents drafted at present that we're prepared to file, and uh, we have countless more therapeutics waiting to be discovered as soon as we can afford to do a, a deeper dig into our library. Um, so this is essentially the mission behind the company and some of the, the better qualities of the company. Uh, as Chris pointed out, you know, we have a library of 200,000 peptides. That's quite a staggering number of peptides. And in the screening that Chris has done to date, the results that we've been achieving are truly spectacular. I think the last screening we did, we gave 79 peptides and came up with seven positive hits out of that. And I believe that study typically sees a ratio of about one out of 600. So that gives you some kind of a sense. Uh, we have the ability to grow this library significantly, and we do so every year. Um, the beauty of a peptide is that it's very cheap to manufacture. It's a very simple process. It's much easier to make a peptide than it is a lot of the other biologic medicines that are out there. They can be very complex to do, take a long time, have stability issues, uh, and they're significantly more expensive. Um, and uh, we have a very interesting business model which I'll get to a little bit later, but uh, the farm industry has been changing radically over the last few years, and um, it's sort of an idea I came up with on my own before I started reading it, and now it seems to be very popular, so I'm happy that I was on to something good and that now people are recognizing that. Uh, these are some of the companies that are involved in biologics. Um, you know, the top list is by no means complete. Those are just some of the major companies that are very aggressive in biologics right now. Um, the bottom companies, these are all companies that are involved in some form of uh, similar research to us. Um, none of them have a library that's on the scale of ours. We're talking primarily under 10,000 peptides, and for many of them a lot less than that. Uh, you know, one of the issues with the various venom peptides, as Chris pointed out, is that the stuff that we're working with is mostly geared towards mammalian targets, and this is very important. If you take a spider or a centipede, these things are mostly killing insects. They're not really designed to tackle a mammal. And I think that they're gonna, you know, count of snails is another one, things in the ocean. Um, there's a lot of interesting potential medicines out of the ocean, but I guess the question I need to ask myself, and I did a while back, is why are we looking there right now when we haven't even begun to look at the mammalian targets? That's kind of a secondary place to be. And so I'm very pleased that Chris was focused where he was, and I think a lot of the reasons that we paired up. Um, this is just a very brief timeline of you know, the operation. Um, it's, of course, uh, guessing it. Um, but essentially, the way that our business model works is that we're, you know, people ask us, how are you going to commercialize this? How are you going to sell this to people? And the answer is, is we're probably not. As I mentioned, the big pharma companies, that's their specialty. And to fill their pipeline, they need to come to us to be a supplier of this pipeline. They don't really have the same creative capacity of a Dr. Shaw who has this fantastic library. In fact, if they wanted to replicate that, it would be a decade or more. It'd be a monumental effort, very expensive, and they would have to have the expertise to do it in the first place. So it's much easier for them to come to us and go shopping and for, look at what we have that would be interesting for them. So we're in the process of taking the peptides and bringing them to contract research organizations to produce animal models to test both toxicity and essentially proof of concept whether or not the target is valid. Uh, and based on that, probably prior to a phase one study with our preliminary data, we're likely to attract pharma partners that want to continue developing this peptide and acquire it. So this brings us to the business model itself. Well, I'm going to just skip ahead to the business model. So essentially, Alphexian is holding the library of our peptides. And rather than anyone trying to acquired the entire company, the way we're set up is that each of our peptides is 
it's in its own individual subsidiary. And this allows a pharma company to not be burdened with doing diligence on this vast library of stuff that's not fully defined or understandable in some cases. It's much easier for them to get just a clear story on, you know, this is a pro-angiogenesis peptide. We're interested in cardiovascular disease. We'd like to acquire this and do a development deal with you. Uh, this brings in revenue. So that's pretty much the model that we're working with. Um, in order to affect this, uh, we have a pretty good team of people. Um, there's no one I would ever trade Chris for in terms of just his knowledge and his expertise in this field. It would be he's irreplaceable to us. Um, for myself, I come from a business background. This is now my second pharmaceutical company. And uh, more importantly than either of us is the person we've attracted, a fellow named Dr. Pedro Huertas, who I was very fortunate enough to know over the past <coughs> few years, and who had just left Shire Pharmaceuticals, where he actually took a Brady kinding receptor peptide and took it through clinical trials and got it approved as a medication for Shire. Now this is very significant because we're drowning in for any kind of receptor peptide. So he already speaks our language and already very familiar with this. So as you can see, uh, and this is a very condensed uh, resume for this man, he's had senior executive positions at multiple companies. Um, he's a PhD from Stanford, an MD from Harvard Medical, and an MBA from MIT. <laughs> it doesn't get um, more white collar than that. So, uh, you know, Pedro's role within the company is to take this medicine and to create a clinical strategy for us to develop the drugs. He has an expertise to know what a pharma company wants to see in terms of data so that they can determine whether or not this is something with a high percentage of passing through clinical trials onto a regulatory approval. So, skipping ahead, that's Alpexin. Thank you for your time. So if Chris and Ari want to just uh, stand in the front, I suppose, or you can feel comfortable there, and um, we'll maybe hit off with a few minutes of question and answering here. So though, yes, well, we're, we're straight off here at the front here, so you want to take the mic there? Yeah, I'm just wondering what, thank you, first of all, I'm just wondering what clinical studies you have actually done, and, and are, those, are those studies under GLP, anything like that? We haven't done any clinical studies up until the present time. We have done some very complex models, animal model, issue efficacy for a 3D compound. Uh, we were talking actually just this morning about going along the line of doing the, the established clinical study models for the, the animal studies that we want to do. And we've already spoken to several uh, peptide companies that are FDA approved and that make peptides under GMP. So we haven't actually got that far yet of doing clinical studies as such. Um, but we are well aware that we need GMP standard materials to do that. And we have taken that on board for the study design. That's more the work of a contract research organization. Uh, if you were talking a human clinical trial for phase one, it's going to be a while before that happens. And I would say the odds are higher that we'll probably be doing that in conjunction with a pharmaceutical partner than just doing it on our own. We have some very interesting veterinary problems. So we have one for the, the cow udders. The what you uh, The udder infection? Yes. Well, one, one of the groups of peptides that is probably the biggest representation in our library are these antibiotic peptides. And we have several thousand of these in our library that we've already characterized. And these peptides are broad spectrum antimicrobial agents. Uh, the te limited testing that we have done has shown that multiple drug resistant organisms are destroyed by these just in the same way that non drug resistant organisms are because of their mechanism of action. And we have one application that we will be pursuing for a family of these peptides as a topical uh, application for some of the diseases of the other that occur in milk uh, cattle. So, mastitis. Conventional antibiotics is you have to test the milk and wait until the secondary metabolites are gone from the milk before it can go for human consumption. But of course, because these are peptides, the secondary metabolites of the peptides are amino acids, and you can't differentiate those from the free amino acids that are present in the milk. So, it's got many advantages over what is available. 
Your question, okay? Is that cool? Yeah, go down at the back here. Oh, they really enjoyed that. Just wondering, Professor Shaw, how you're finding the move from academic world to the commercial world? Well, that's a very, very good question. Uh, as Norman will probably tell you, I think he's, he's had to leave early. I have had a toe in the, the water of the commercial world for probably the last 25 years, on and off. Uh, trying to get this particular area recognized by the commercial world that, that has not actually managed to happen. Uh, I have no problems adapting to the commercial world, but I think one of the things I would like to make very plain is that I am not currently a businessman. I may develop that as a business develops. But my expertise and my love and my first love resides in the laboratory. I think as Ari said, one of the reasons he was attracted here was that, um, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I'm going to use his words, that he deems that what we have in our laboratory is this very rare commodity, which is creativity and research. That is something I would not like to sacrifice. That's something, in fact, I intend to build, build upon, because that is the, the powerhouse of the whole company, in a sense. So I have no problem adapting to that environment, but I have to maintain my major presence at the bench, so to speak, because I believe that's the source of the creativity that actually will run and expand the company. Uh, all I would say is that I did look around at the other people in the field. I actually studied it quite thoroughly, and uh, it did not take me long at all to recognize what Chris had and the uniqueness of it. Uh, it was absolutely differentiated from anything else I found out there, and uh, I couldn't be happier with the choice I made. So. Any other questions on the floor? Yep, down at the back there. Bear with me as I joke dying. Question for Chris. Uh, just by the nature of these compounds and the fact that they are specific to mammalian targets, are there higher risks with these than there would be with a, a chemical compound? Uh, higher risks in, in, in what sense? In uh, clinical trials, just you know, giving the drugs to, to healthy volunteers. You, can you predict in advance what they will do within the human? Well, it's a very good point, and of course, it's something that was one of the very first <coughs> considerations when we started our peptide drug development program. But the Conan article some, some months ago in Nature Drug Discovery, if you have a, a small molecule novel chemical, then you can be 99, actually a couple of decimal points out of the top of that, certain that it's going to be too toxic and it's going to feel toxicity. On the other hand, if you have a peptide that you're putting into a trial, you can be 99.9% .9 certain it's not going to be toxic. So it's almost a mirror image, one or the other. The, the good money, I believe, was on peptides because many, many clinical trials of peptide-based drugs has shown that toxicity is really very, very early, with just a few exceptions, ever an issue. So you can be very, very certain you're not going to have toxic side effects. The very fact that they are broke, that the mechanism by where they act, usually on surface targets, often receptors, sometimes ion channels, sometimes proteases, etc. They're broken down very quickly and recycled very quickly. So the accumulation of secondary metabolites and indeed off-target effects are very, very, very rare with peptide based drugs. So the answer to that is I would be quite confident going forward with a peptide based drug that we would uh, we would get to our end point very faster than with a synthetic chemical. And I think the pharmaceutical industry is now beginning to recognize this and define this to their cost to some extent, literally. I would also just add to that that when you go into a laboratory and you manufacture a chemical that you are hoping is a drug candidate, many times these are completely synthetic molecules and human bodies have been developing over more than a million years. It's a totally alien substance entering it. The body, when it, it, it has this reaction of, wow, what is this in there? Whereas the peptide seems to flow and just be a more natural process in the body. The body's more, it, it's, it's easily recognizable by the body. So I, that's one of the reasons I think that this is the trend in the industry is that it's moving away from this just random chemical interaction and going towards something that the body recognizes and works with immediately. Yeah, 
there, there's another interesting point, somewhat associated with that, that we that we were discussing last evening, which actually we hadn't really thought about before, but it came out in our conversation based upon something that Ari had read, a study in Amsterdam, where they found that by taking samples of the local lakes, they could identify cocaine, yeah, and about 10 different drugs in, in the water. And of course, one of the big advantages of peptide drugs is they are broken down within the body into harmless amino acids. The chemical drugs that we take if you think about it, they are metabolized, they are excreted either in feces or urine. But where does that go? That goes into the environment. What is the fate of these novel chemical metabolite molecules that enter our environment? And the answer to that is, we have absolutely no idea what effect that is having on our environment. Apart from some studies in the past, which has shown that even highly treated water that is emptied into rivers. We're very fortunate in Northern Ireland in that most of our water comes from mountain reservoirs. And when, it go, when, we, when we drink it, it's first pass, effectively, yeah? But if you live in areas of England, for instance, or Europe, your water comes from the river. And while we can take the bacteria out and the particles out, we can't take viruses out of it, number one, but we definitely cannot take out a lot of these drug metabolites. And there are many studies showing that downstream of some of these treated sewage effluents, that the fish, the male fish, become feminized. And that happened after the advent of the, of the birth control pill. So that's where that secondary metabolite, or excess, was ending up. It was actually feminizing the trout. So if you take on board the statins and ACE inhibitors and all of those drugs that we take, what effect they're having when they enter our and they do under the environment, we have no idea whatsoever. But undoubtedly they're having some effects that we may come to be aware of in the future. So that is sort of related to your question. And again, the peptides come out on top with respect to that. Nice one, happy enough. Good question, thank you. Um, we have one here with Mike, and then we'll go over to you next, okay? Thank you, gentlemen. That was very interesting. Could you just to expand somewhat on the comment about the ease with which productionization can be ramped up quickly? I mean, I, I immediately envisage a huge frog farm. <laughs> Have I got that right? Well, no, actually, because all we really need, in effect, is one specimen, one sample from one specimen. In fact, the truth be known, the sophistication of our analytical equipment. We can actually take the secretion of one specimen and we can determine the structures of all of its peptides on probably about one thousandth of the material we get from one specimen. So gone are the days, and in fact you're right, because 25, 30, 40 years ago, they collected thousands of the species, they killed them, they skinned them, they chemically extracted their skin. So I have been working with at least two companies, Thermo Fisher being the main one, where we have been using our peptide model, elucidation model, as a means of uh, working with our scientists to make their equipment more sensitive and more reproducible. And that has been the result that's produced many, many publications with the public. So we have helped with this system develop the equipment. Once we have the structure of each individual peptide, because peptides are polymers of amino acids, some years ago a chap called Bruce Merrifield, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, put the technique, devised a technique where you could use a solid phase support and basically add the amino acid. So basically we can have the structure of a peptide within 10 minutes of putting it on our equipment. We normally validate that, so it takes probably another few days to validate that. Within 24 hours we can have made from that a tiny, tiny amount, a few micrograms of that peptide. We can make uh, tens of grams over and that can be extended in the industrial production of hundreds of kilograms. The, the, the processes are there. And because our peptides, I made the point, our peptides are six and seven amino acids respectively. These are so cheap to make and so rapid to make and so relatively simple to purify that compared with some of their competitor recombinant human proteins, the cost of producing these peptides is probably 0.1% per unit. 
very readily made, a very, very cheap thing as well. Okay, and we'll move over here. <coughs> this is this is Jim, so go for it. Uh, you've already answered one of my questions in terms of uh, the cost aspect uh, and, and how that's going relating to, for example, the cost of a cancer drug at the minute. Uh, and, and you've obviously explained that. Uh, when do you see these uh, first product coming actually commercially onto the market? I'd say eight years if I had to take a guess. It's not, a, it's not a short process. And, uh, you know, for all the evils of FDA and all the criticisms that they take or, you know, a similar regulatory body, the truth is, is that without them, just look at the nutraceutical industry. I mean, there's just crazy claims to stuff that's all over the place. Half this stuff, you have no idea what it's doing when you put it in your body. And pharmaceutical companies were allowed to behave in the same manner without having human trials, which are not perfect, but in the absence of them, people will be dropping left and right. I think if I might just add to that in, a, in, a, in a, another sense, that I think one of the things that has held us back for so long on the problem is that there has been a mindset that we are trying to set up a pharmaceutical company, and nothing could be further from the truth. Because the clinical trials and the marketing of the drug is where the vast majority of the funding and drug development actually is required. And we never, ever from the outset, in terms of assessing power from Almac sitting at the back down there. And even a company like Almac wouldn't consider doing that. But it's the early stage, it's the discovery, it's getting that basic data on the molecule. So that, I think Gary used the term, you know, the companies can come shopping for these lead compounds that are unique compounds, maybe for unique disease targets, and then take that and develop. So effectively, you know, we are, I said to someone earlier, I regard what we do as a bit like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You know, the pharma companies are Snow White and we're the Seven Dwarfs. We go up whistling merrily in the morning to mine these drug tablets uh, and present them to Snow White at the end of the day and hope we get our dinner. Yeah? <laughs> so that simplistically is what we do. The discovery company, and if you look at the, at the markets, as Ari does sort of every 15 minutes, this is what the pharma companies are looking looking for these niche companies with niche drugs, especially those in new and unique chemical spaces, to purchase or to license and to take them on board and to do the rest of the work. The problem is they don't even, they don't have that discovery at the present time. That's why their pipelines are dry up. And some of them dramatically so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, question? If you get one question in, sorry, you get the voice. I did get one question in from Slow, it's um, certainly serious. There's uh, one of the young lads who uh, is on Generation Innovation on you know, um, a science and technology scheme for young, uh, young people. So that, um, he just said, how do I get involved? The interest is going to be huge. He's got half a million dollars. Right. It will help. It will help. You know, I'd love to run out and hire 100 people. I really would, but it's going to take a little while. And I guess I didn't really touch on this in our dialogue and didn't really plan to, but you know, the one thing that I think uh, some of you here may find interesting is that I think a lot of entrepreneurs believe that your only answer in life is to go pair up with a VC and that the, that's the only way of funding a company. Um, we're not going to do that. And most people hear this and say, come on. Well, okay. Because simply, uh, if we just scroll back a little bit. So, just like a pharma company wanting to acquire us would have trouble getting that central Alphaxian company, you know, wrapping their head around that, uh, the VC has a similar problem as well. If I walk in and say, uh, I'd like to do a deal, and they say, well, what do you want for pre-money value? I'd be selling myself short under any circumstance. And so, in this case, what we've chosen to do is, uh, we're targeting about a million pound raise for Alphaxian. This will be a one-off. People will get in at that phase after that. Alphexin as a company will not be open to investment. Individual peptides will. So if I need to raise you know, $5 million to do a phase one clinical study for pro-angiogenesis, I may turn to a VC at that point and take one single peptide and develop it in conjunction with the VC. But I will not give the company away to a VC. 
So this is kind of an interesting, this is why I said that we have a very state-of-the-art business model. It's allowing the founders and the people who are, have vested interest in the company to maintain control of it and to see the strategy through. Uh, eventually, I'm sure the company will get bought, but you know, on our terms, we'll go ready. Okay, that's good. Uh, I think, can everybody join together? Or do you have one more question? Too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what intellectual property do you actually have? Do you have any patents or anything on your technology or, or on any of the uh, peptides? Yes, we have two composition of matter patents that were recently approved. They were the two peptides that we highlighted, so a pro and anti-angiogenesis. Um, we have nine other peptides that are drafted and ready to file, which will happen very shortly. And uh, I mean, we're an IP machine. I mean, if I had the money, I could file a few hundred patents and sure. That's, that, that's really, I'm, I'm just curious if you have no other revenue stream and you have all these patents, how do you, how do you plan on maintaining them if you don't have the revenue coming in? Uh, but we will. So the first two, here's another interesting thing that we, maybe some of you picked up on, but we didn't actually say it about peptide, is that one single peptide, uh, you'll do a toxicity study in the animal models, and you'll now know the toxicity features of that peptide. However, that peptide might have two to 10 possible therapeutic indications for which you'll have to do individual studies on each one of those. But having that talk study is kind of nice. You're only doing it once. And so there's real value. I think if you recall when we were showing the uh, anti-angiogenesis, we mentioned three of the indications. I think there's maybe five you know, potential that we could, could be there, three that we're very certain of. Um, that's interesting for a drug company, because suddenly they can acquire a composition of matter patent, and now they have access to not just one indication, but multiple indications on one molecule. So the question is, is how do, we, how do we maintain the revenue off that? The answer is that we have very attractive assets to partner with the pharma company. We have a lot to offer them. We can actually fill these depleted pipelines and do it very quickly. So a typical pharma partnering deal involves an upfront payment. The earlier stage in the clinic it is, uh, they consider it a higher risk, so you tend to have a lightly weighted front end payment uh, that gets progressively bigger as you roll through the clinic and you know, if it's very light in the front end, it might even be double digit royalty on the back end. So uh, we plan on using this type of uh, transaction in order to bring capital into the company. We're going to raise just enough money that we can get enough clinical data to sit down with the pharma company and say, we want to get this and we want it right now. And that upfront payment that we receive, that will be funded in our next phase of operations. So we've got two assets right now to do that with. Uh, five indications at least. Okay. I think that's just about all uh, we have time for. Chris, Ari, um, thank you very much. Um, thank everybody who could show our appreciation to Chris and Ari. For